Well, it's a great honour and a privilege for me today to welcome Dr Jonathan Wright to London on a rather grey September day, unfortunately. But uh, as he's from the Tahoma Centre near Seattle, I think he might be used to. It's quite accustomed to it. <laughs> Please to hear it. Please to hear it. And, um, of course, Dr Wright is known for his enormous experience uh, and uh, skills in integrative medicine. And, in fact, he is a pioneer in the field of natural medicine. He and his team spend an enormous amount of time and effort unearthing uh, published information that they then take that experience and that knowledge and apply very successfully to their patients. Furthermore, of course, Dr. Wright has been very prolific in producing cutting-edge information for the public, and many of you will no doubt own a copy or be subscribed to his Nutrition and Health Healing newsletter, which is a very, very good read indeed. So what we hope to talk about a little bit today is the role of estrogens and progesterones and some other interesting uh, nutritional developments as well to help ladies during the difficult menopause years. So, good morning, Dr. Wright. Yeah, good morning, Phil, and thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you, it's a pleasure. I wonder, perhaps, if we may start um, with me asking a question, which is, why did you write your new book, uh, Stay Young and Sexy with Bioidentical Hormones? Uh, what prompted you to write that? It's an update of a book written in 1997, um, which had to do with the same topic, except it was more moderately titled uh, natural, natural Hormone Replacement. That was written uh, to point out that in 1997, the then current use of horse estrogens and progestins was really rather dangerous, mm -hmm. and that the identical to natural hormones were, of course, safer. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say perfectly safe, because even young people with their own hormones do have troubles from time to time, mm -hmm. but definitely safer than those horse hormones and progestins. Ah, right, thank you. Which is probably why you subtitle that, uh, that particular book, uh, Natural Replacement Therapies, uh, Don't Let Your Doctor Give You Horse Your Eye. Quite so, quite so. <laughs> thank you. And besides, the, the, it's, not, it's not as bad for your aspect. There's the whole aspect of why it's good for one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's quite frightening, actually, that despite your uh, inaugural publication 15 years ago, okay. that today there are still probably millions of people, your ladies, walking around who are not aware that the HRT that their doctor is giving them is not human bioidentical. Well, that's true, but fortunately many fewer millions. Uh, the use in the States, for example, has dropped from um, some eight... Well, I don't know if it was eight million. It was eight billion dollars in sales wow. anyway, wow. and the sales have now dropped to three billion dollars from eight. So many, many fewer, thank goodness. Um, now, yes, uh, the book, uh, the original book, was out fifteen years ago, mm -hmm. but one doesn't write a book when one just starts doing things. So actually, we've been doing the bioidentical hormones since the early nineteen eighties, mm -hmm. and then uh, felt we knew enough. I knew enough about it. Uh, to write a book, and by the way, I should give credit to my co-author, Dr. Lane Leonard, mm -hmm. uh, who also uh, wrote a good part of the book. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wright, for mentioning that. I was wondering, in general then, and you obviously have an enormous experience in seeing patients, and I was wondering, how do the women react or get on with, compared to, so in other words, those women who are using traditional HRT, shall we say, compared to those who are using bioidentical uh, HRT, what sort of differences do you see? Well, I can sum it up best by what I would hear from women over and over who would switch from the uh, horse urine estrogen plus mm -hmm. what's called progestin, mm -hmm. which is not the same as progesterone mm -hmm. uh, that belongs in the body. It's an artificial sort. What I would hear from the women who would switch from that to the identical to natural hormones is, oh, I feel like myself again. Yeah. And that is the thing I heard most commonly is, oh, I feel like myself again. Great. Well, certainly, because it's the same molecules that were in there in the first place, um, simply having disappeared or at least reduced quite a bit at menopause, mm -hmm. now being brought back up. Fantastic. Well, that's, that's great news indeed. Thank you. Um, have you found, may I ask, getting into a little bit more detail, have you found any particular bioidentical estrogen ratios that do well? Because uh, we should perhaps explain there are 
three predominant estrogens in the in the female body. Is there a particular ratio that you prefer? Well, actually, there are at least a couple of dozen estrogens, ah. <laughs> and you're quite right. They're in all different proportions. The ones that are talked about the most are those three you mentioned, mm -hmm. but there are many, many, many. Um, what I try to do is make sure that there are always more of the anti-carcinogenic estrogens mm -hmm. going in as replacement mm -hmm. than the pro-carcinogenic. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who doesn't know, and I'm sure you do, Phil, um, hormones are always in a balance. Mm -hmm. There's some that are pro-carcinogenic and some that are anti-carcinogenic. Mm -hmm. That's nature's way. Mm -hmm. And since most of us, our bodies metabolize more of the anti-carcinogens than the pro-carcinogens, mm -hmm. we don't get cancer. And that's the way we want to keep it when we're doing hormone replacement is more of the, uh, one could call them the good ones than the bad ones. Right. Thank mm -hmm. you. That's, mm -hmm. that's a very important point. So what might be a typical dose ratio for a lady who wants to start using bioidentical estrogens, mm -hmm. please, uh, Dr. Wright, what would you think? Well, the predominant anti-carcinogenic one is called estriol, mm -hmm. and the predominant pro-carcinogenic uh, is called estradiol. Mm -hmm. Now, one might wonder, what are we doing with pro-carcinogenic hormones? Mm -hmm. It just turns out they're more powerful. And for example, the pro-carcinogen estradiol is more responsible for women, mm -hmm. for breast development, hip development, secondary sexual development. Um, the estriol, oddly enough, has been found to have more to do with the emotional life. Okay. Although it does have other estrogen effects, it's not as strong mm -hmm. as the estradiol. So one simply wants more of the anti-carcinogen than the pro-carcinogen. For years, I've been doing a ratio of 20% of one. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's much more powerful, mm -hmm. so we don't need that much more. Mm -hmm. And 80% of the other. Mm -hmm. And then doctors, other doctors, who of course have their own ideas. You've heard the thing about two doctors or two attorneys in a room, you have four different opinions? <laughs> of course. Very good, yes. And that's in each room, too, yes. not, not just with four of them. Uh, so other doctors have changed the ratios about a bit, but I'm happy to report that almost always the anti-carcinogen is in the at least slight majority mm -hmm. in just about everybody's prescriptions. Very good, very good, understood, thank you for that. Moving slightly away, if we can, from estrogen just for a moment, of course the late Dr. Uh, John Lee wrote a book, uh, What Your Doctor Won't Tell You About Progesterone. How important do you think progesterone is in, in a bioidentical replacement therapy for ladies? Well, it's overwhelmingly important, uh, as is the estrogen. If we're copying nature, and the whole principle of so-called natural medicine is to copy what nature does as closely as possible, mm -hmm. since we're not geniuses enough to be able to create people on our own. Mm -hmm. Well, in a way we are, but I mean thinking mm -hmm. to do so. If we copy nature as closely as we can, we're least likely to get into trouble. Of and notice I didn't say we won't get into trouble, mm -hmm. but least likely yes. anyway. Yes. Um, so, from the time a woman starts making many more hormones at age 12, 13, 14, 15, mm -hmm. whatever it is, mm -hmm. her ovaries always make estrogen, progesterone, mm -hmm. both. And they make them in certain quantities and at certain times. So one wants to copy those quantities and copy those times of the month as closely as one can. And it's really not wise to do just one, either one, mm -hmm. without the other, because that's what the ovaries do. <laughs> And while we're at it, of course, as you know very well, there's also testosterone being made by the ovaries, mm -hmm. just a little bit, mm -hmm. but we want to make sure there's a little bit of that either present or we replace it once. I see, I see. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. Thank you. <clears throat> so I think the, you probably answered my next question, which was going to be should or indeed must progesterone be used with an estrogen therapy? What your opinion would be? It should be, it should absolutely. Be. Now, as far as must, I suppose there's somebody who would just say, I don't want to. Mm -hmm. And that's always someone's right. Mm -hmm. But really, if it's going to be kept as safe as possible and as effective as possible, yes, yes it should be. Good. Thank you very much for that. Of course, uh, the USP grade progesterones have become much better available, bioidentical progesterones mm -hmm. have become much better available in recent mm -hmm. years, particularly in the United States. What kind of dosing therapy would you recommend uh, for, for, for an average? Mm -hmm if we can uh, call the, uh, a woman an average, the average woman. Well, let, when we get to dosing, there's two things. One, how much of it? Mm -hmm. Number two, how do we get it into the body? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to go to the latter first, because even though it's widely known, it's not well enough known that these hormones should never be swallowed 
There is one exception, but when they're made by the ovaries, they get into the bloodstream, go to the heart, go all over the body, mm -hmm. and then as a little bit goes by the liver with every pass of blood, it's what's called conjugated and excreted, mm -hmm. whereas if we swallow them, it all goes to the liver, and the liver just says, oh, garbage, and tries to get rid of it, and in fact, the estrogens themselves can cause problems if they're swallowed. Fortunately, progesterone causes no problems if it's swallowed, mm -hmm. but even so, if it's going to be metabolized properly, it needs to be rubbed in. Right. And those routes of administration are called transdermal mm -hmm. or transmucosal, which is a technicality we need to get mm -hmm. into. But mm -hmm. uh, All right, uh, having talked about the routes of administration, most of the time, there is an exception for progesterone, part of the progesterone, and certainly not all of it, mm -hmm. but part of it, um, if it's swallowed, the liver does something unique with it. It turns into tranquilizers. That's kind of nice. And it's nature's tranquilizers. They're ones, they're molecules that are made naturally. So if a woman's having trouble sleeping, or she's having PMS, yes. or she's just feeling off and anxious, yes. then part of the progesterone being rubbed in, so it's metabolized in the usual way the progesterone is, mm -hmm. and part swallowed to help her settle down, that is the exception to always rub it in. And with estrogens, they always should be rub it, rubbed in, 100%. Yes. Getting to doses, um, with progesterone, if one is firmly after the menopause, mm -hmm. it's usually between 50 and 100 milligrams, perhaps a bit more, but not usually. Mm -hmm. uh, estrogens, a whole lot less if mm -hmm. it's after the menopause. And there, we're usually between one and a half and about three milligrams, mm -hmm. and again, rubbed in yes. and not swallowed. Thank you. And what about testosterone? Mm -hmm. Well, oddly enough, some women's bods, bodies continue making sufficient testosterone even after menopause. Mm -hmm. But that's a minority, mm -hmm. and most do not. And so a little dab of testosterone is also useful. Um, testosterone helps keep the muscles up. It's mm -hmm. not just for libido. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason there's so many more little old ladies than little old men. Yes. Because without the testosterone, which women have virtually zero of by mm -hmm. the time they get to be 70 or 80, mm -hmm. The muscles go, mm. whereas men have a much more gradual decline, and mm. yes, they lose muscle mass mm. without testosterone replacement, Thank but you. not as much as women. That, and would you also recommend that testosterone is applied transdermally? Every yeah. one of these hormones needs to be rubbed in for the body to use it appropriately, yes. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Very interesting indeed. Thank you.